Jeff. Thank you for working with me. Um, and thank you all for, for being here. Looks like we've, we've got it. Um, to springboard a little bit off of what Ara had said, uh, I'm, I'm here to talk with you just about, about how he introduced this, the science and the social aspects of, of environment in, in Armenia, particularly pertaining to the forest. Um, I've been working with Jeff now for five years, uh, and since we started, we've, we've learned a lot of tough lessons, and, and we've seen a lot of changes, and so that's, that's what I want to dive into. But before we get into sort of the meat of Armenia, and he's, it, the, the specifics of, of what's going on there, I want to be very clear about what we're talking about when we speak about resilience and, and about forests. So what do I mean when I say forest? Am I, am I speaking only of, of trees? Am I, am I, is it just this, these woody, tall things that are bigger than us and that are fantastic? Is it a magical place? Uh, it depends on if you're an eight-year-old or if you're a lumberman. But broadly, from like to start out from an academic standpoint, uh, the meaning of forest, it's, it's an adaptive and complex system with multiple feedback cycles, uh, highly nonlinear. When we look at a forest system, we're looking at the soils, we're looking at the climate, uh, we're looking at the flora, obviously the, the trees, the, you know, the, the most notable uh, floristic component, but also the herbaceous layer, uh, the, the bacterial biota in the soil. Um, all of these things, all of these things that have uh, a great deal of effect on each other at different scales in time and, great, and, and scales in space. And so that's what, that's what the science of forestry is focused on, dealing, dealing with those feedbacks. And one of the most notable and most difficult to model is the people. People are part of the forest system, and that's, and that's something that we work with on a daily basis at, at ATP. It's, it's something that we all engage uh, when we're trying to engineer solutions for what we see as problems. So taking that science, what do we know about forests? What can we model? Well, we understand soils fairly well. We can, we can measure the amount of nitrogen, phosphorus, uh, potassium in, in the soil and, and know how productive it's going to be. We know a lot about trees. Arig just talked about these, these poplars and they've looked at where they grow and how they grow. We can model that. We can, we can assess, given what, given what inputs they have, how they'll do. Other plants, animals, uh, same, how they compete. People, that one on the bottom, that's the crazy wild card. <clears throat> that's the one that makes it all so so difficult to deal with. Um, and that's that's what we'll wind up talking about towards the end, um, along along with this. And, and these images, just, just to give you an idea, um, I work a, a lot in quantitative modeling now. Um, early on, it was, it was statistical modeling with pheromone plumes for beetles, but that was, that's, it's a forest pest. But, but now more in, um, understanding how forests transition through time. And what we understand in the science now, wh where the conversation is, is that forests are dynamic systems. We don't anticipate that they're going to grow to some, there's not really some ideal place for a forest that it must be, and that's how they should always be. There's not some United States that existed in 1492 before, before, you know, we, before everything got started with, with development that we should aspire to. The forest is a dynamic system. And, and so that's, that's where we're at. Computational power, we're now able to, to deal with that. But it's the social aspect. It's the social aspect that makes it so difficult. I just told you an academic definition of a forest or sort of an academic standpoint of how we should look at forests. We can calculate it. We can break it down into numerical ideas. But for every person in this room, me included, all of us, we have a different we have a different idea of what a forest is. We have we we see it differently. It's a place like every you know everything in this room was either grown or mined. It, the forest may may provide those resources. That may be how you look at a forest. It's productive. It may be a fantastic place to go see a bear, or um, well, or to be afraid of a bear. Uh, I guess if you were to see one in the wild, um, a, a place for profit, a place for biodiversity, a place simply to go and relax and have a horabots. Uh, it may have spiritual <laughs> meaning. But the question is, fundamentally, is a forest in one state, and by state I mean a certain structure, what you imagine is the, the ideal forest, is that a good forest? Or a logger might think of a great forest, totally different. It's those values that you place on the forest that, that fundamentally change how we, how we perceive what, what is acceptable and what is unacceptable, and those differences for each individual, for each community group, um, those are the problems that we have to met out. And, and that's where we leverage the science to try and come up with better decisions about, we'll take what we have, and, and what, what's the goal? What do we really want the forest to look like? So in this room, the question I would be interested in hearing the response, your response on is, 
what is the right forest for Armenia? And we'll talk about that, hopefully. So what's today's forest? Well, before we can say what we want, well, what do we have? What's even possible? Um, unfortunately, uh, it's despite the advances in satellite technology and, <coughs> um, and our understanding about, about statistics and counting, forests in Armenia are, are poorly defined. They're, they're, poorly, they're poorly understood. So 40, 25, 11, 6, 7, these are all percentages that if you read different, different texts that Armenia, like that's the amount of forest, the amount of forest coverage that Armenia has had over time. And if you ascribe to one of those numbers, then you've politically allied yourself with one group of, of people or you've made an enemy with another. What most people agree upon is that during, during the energy crisis, well, I think what everyone agrees upon, uh, is that during the energy crisis, uh, people went and harvested trees. In the absence of gas, in the absence of electricity, they needed heat. And the forest was there for them. It is a resource and it can be used that way. It's a renewable resource. And they harvested, but they did so at the fringes of their community, and they did so without thinking about the next day because they were focused on the problems of that day. That, that crisis has passed to some degree. People still rely heavily on wood for development and, and for heat, but they're still harvesting. And so there's been some, you know, and, and with the efforts of ATP and, and others, a lot of, the, a lot of those, those forests are now beginning to make a comeback. But the state of the forest is fundamentally different. There, there is still harvesting going on in the, in the sense of, um, of fuel wood harvesting. Every, every family unit has a man and his son and his donkey that go up with a dull hatchet and harvest what they can and burn it almost immediately, uh, not allowing it to be seasoned, which effectively changes the, the uh, amount of energy that they can expect to get from the wood. There are commercial interests, um, broadly, which are, are for the most part illegal in, in nature and, and so must must function on a black market, um, and in so doing, the, the revenues from those hardly ever get back to the people um, <clears throat> who's, who live in that environment. And third, and what's most rarely talked about, I think, in Armenia is the harvest or the grazing of, of cattle and, and pigs in, in a forest setting, and, and that is what, um, in the field, you would call latent deforestation. And the way that that works is those cows and pigs wind up eating the small seedlings, and there's no smaller trees to take the place of older trees when they pass away, whether or when they die from either natural, uh, natural causes or because they're harvested. And trees do die from natural causes. They, there are lifespans for, for different species. And when I, what I have down here is tragedy of percentage definitions. And what I mean by that is whether you ascribe to the six or seven number or 11 number, which are both being floated right now by different, different organizations, is, is broadly irrelevant. And it's a distraction in that if you're focused on that number and you can't and we can't move the, the conversation beyond a number, what we all agree on and, and like each each of the organizations that pitch that those numbers, they, they agree that forests are, are an issue in, in Armenia and that they that as part of functioning um, communities, if those are unstable, those communities are unstable. So what's the goal? I use that word unstable and I meant to. Um, simply because people talk a lot about sustainable, sustain, um, mm -hmm. and the idea there is that we shouldn't take more, or we shouldn't harvest more, um, or do damage to an ecosystem such that those that come after us can't reap the same benefits from it. Resilience is, you know, for, for those of you who are engineers, um, it's, it's very similar, the ecological definition is very similar to the engineering definition in that the idea is that all systems are under um, face disturbance. A resilient system in the face of disturbance can, imagine if you're pushing one of these balls with, with some level of force, let's say the, the energy crisis, that is a disturbance, it's a social disturbance. So people needed to harvest wood, and, and to, you know, to be fair, it's, it's, an, it's an unstable region, seismically, uh, uh, politically, so <clears throat> it's likely that they're that they're going to face disturbance in the future, but a resilient system, when faced with disturbance, can return to the state that it once was. A system that is not resilient faces what's called fundamental state change. State change being, if you har like in in terms of forestry, if you if you clear cut everything, and it's a very steep hill, and the soils are erodible, and a rain comes, 
you wash away the soil which, which keeps the forest growing. If that soil's gone, that soil took thousands of years to develop, to become nutrient rich, to be, to be able to support that ecosystem. In that case, you fundamentally change the ability of that, of that area to support a forest. What grows next, and something may, is not going to be the same type of system that you, that you had before. It'll be something different, and like a lower energy system, a lower value system. So people recognized this problem. In 2005, a new policy was passed that allows communities to manage forests. Right now in Armenia, all forest is state-owned, state-run. And this was actually an exceptionally progressive, um, progressive policy. While not yet implemented, it, the dream, the goal, is to take, um, take communities and help them engage in a democratic uh, process to identify what values they care about. Forests can be many of those things that we talked about in I think, the second slide. Heat, biodiversity, uh, revenue. All of these things are important, but in what proportions? And so how do we, how do we keep that going? Um, this is what we're focused on right now. The problem with what, everything that I've talked to up until, up until this, this moment is that it's all sort of hand-waving. Um, talking at, at the scale that I am, talking just about Armenia, just about percentages, or just about definitions, really doesn't help get a fundamental grasp of, of what's going on on the ground. Uh, this woman, uh, I, I lived with her, uh, Nare, she's making bread, uh, she's using some wood that was harvested. We were, I, I spent um, about three months in Armenia living with a family and conducting research in the Margohovit uh, areas just to the west of Dilijan. Uh, and this is the community right there. So let's talk about some of these things in relation to Margohovit, in relation to that family. This is a, an aerial view of the community. This, this is the center of the community right here. Um, and what, what I'm showing you right now is that they are managing the forest. Even though they just passed that legislation that allows them to manage the forest, <coughs> management is happening, but it's unplanned. And so what happens is forests are being harvested on the fringes. And that harvesting is being followed by grazing. So those forests don't return. Um, it's, you know, they needed, they, there was a time that they needed fuel wood, they cut. But if they don't allow it to return to forest, the next disturbance that happens, they won't have that resource to fall back on. So there's cattle damage occurring, there's logging damage occurring, and this actually, this area, this large area on the right, that's Dilijan. Uh, what I'd like you to note, um, and I, I regret that the, you know, you have to trust me on this one, um, dark is bad. Um, well, actually, this, these are errors uh, for the scientists in the room. Um, these are actually the, the estimates. Um, the darker it is, the worse it is. Logging and cattle damage is, is happening, uh, or grazing damage to the forest is happening in Dilijan as well. There's no, there's no real protection uh, going on um, at the moment, and largely because the government simply doesn't have resources to, to deal with it. The better way that we're proposing, the better way that we want to work through the, the amazing, like, amazingly progressive policies that were passed in Armenia uh, as ATP, this better way is a planned method of management, taking the science that we understand, taking what we believe we know through conversations with the community about their social structure and their social need, to develop a, a management strategy that addresses the dynamic nature of forests, transitions them over, over a period of time, and ensures that you're getting the value that you want out of the forest over a period of time without risking those fundamental state changes. A resilient community, forest and, and social. <clears throat> the way that works in a modeling sense is you take what we have today, the current state, a current good measure of, of the forest cover, and you think about all the different things you could do. Nothing. Um, these retention delay, thin, then later retention, our, our forest returns simply for either either harvesting more or less. And in, at different points in time, we can project what, what the future would hold from a structural standpoint. From a, from a value standpoint, we can also address, well, in 2012, what level of biodiversity is being supported by that structure? In 2047, what level of biodiversity? And by that, I mean um, how many of these endangered lilies will be supported or orchids supported under underneath this forest canopy? How many breeding pair of Caucasian brown bear may be supported by that broad area of forest? So it's all about balancing of values. 
And the challenge again, just, just to make sure we're not missing it, is that everyone has a different value, value um, sort of proposition to the forest. Everyone looks at it with different eyes. And so it's all about engaging a better conversation in, in, in the community to identify what that is. And ideally, land on a, a unified plan for a community where there is benefit, where there are jobs created, where fuel wood is provided so that people don't have to go and harvest every week during the winter with a donkey. They don't have to be outlaws simply to, to heat their homes and to cook their meals. Uh, that there should be a functioning forest economy. There's, there's, a, there's a furniture market in Yerevan and it shouldn't be, there shouldn't have to be a black market. And the answer to that black market is to make, to make a legal market and to make sure that the harvesting that does occur is done sustainably. It doesn't compromise the resilience of, of these communities. Two common failures, two, two things that, that internationally we find um, where mi mistakes are made, and, and this is, again, this is a little sweeping, but one, and I was, I was guilty of this, to, to be honest with you, um, when I first started working with ATP, I was uh, what I guess the social scientists call a, um, a positivist. I believed that I could model everything. I believed I could measure it all. Um, and if I built a good enough model, if the science was sound enough, then what argument could you possibly have? This is a sustainable forest. You told me that you need 90 cubic meters of, of wood. It's providing that. If you don't have social buy-in, if, if, if the plan doesn't resonate with the people who are meant to enact it, it's useless. Um, alternatively, without the science, uh, focusing only on values, the conversation often just dies. Um, so it winds up having unintended consequences. It winds up failing to meet the values that people stated that they wanted. So focusing on a balance is, is our goal. Uh, I, there was a lot of text. I thought I'd throw an image at you. Everybody loves images. Uh, this is the science. This is, uh, this is Margo Hobbit community. This is, uh, there was a picture of, of some, some uh, houses. That's broadly right here. Uh, the forest you were looking at in the, in the image is back here. There's a pine forest here. What this is is <coughs> productivity of, of the forest, uh, mostly this green area. Red is the most productive, meaning that there's the most photosynth uh, photosynthesis uh, occurring there. Um, so anyway, the, this roughly would be how we, we calculate the growth rates of, of those trees. It's one of the base layers. And uh, just I love this picture largely because I loved her bread. It was, uh, <laughs> I still dream about it. Um, I, I don't know how she did it. Um, and, and then again, just to throw in a picture of the community. Trying to bridge these two is the great challenge of, of the field today. It's where the conversation is. Um, in, in you know, the halls of academia, um, in Armenia uh, with ATP, it's hard. Um, and we're still trying to figure out how to do it well to do it at all. Uh, we're working to implement a, a forest management plan in this village that addresses their values, that addresses the science. Um, there's, there are a lot of voices in this. There's a lot of concern, uh, and, and I think rightfully so. Will we address bird issues? Um, will, uh, you know, will erosion be prevented? Uh, what about trails going into Dilijan? Uh, what if somebody goes and harvests without consent of the community? What if someone shows up and says, well, I, I have lots of money and I demand that we do this? It's hard. So that's, you know, that's, that's where we're at. So, so now we have Margohovit, this little place. Um, we're talking about, like in Margohovit, we're talking about managing 750 acres and trying to keep people from cutting in what is uh, state reserve and keeping, keeping them from cutting in Dilijan. But this is the neighborhood. And I, I threw this slide in based on a conversation I had last night with someone when um, you know, they were surprised to know that Georgia was so well forested and, and that Armenia wasn't. And um, these, these Kelly Green patches um, here, this is where we're working. They don't have much to work with. This, this, sort of, this olive is more of a chaparral, more of the, the type of forest that you see around here in California. Um, this is more like what you'd expect to see in Connecticut.